Cobra is legally a car. Woohoo! So in today's video, I'm going to catch you up on putting the body on, getting the car legally a car, and what's been going on in the first 350 miles of driving. I'd actually forgotten that I hadn't posted a video since the first drive back in the spring. My goal at that time was to try to get the car drivable and legal so that I could drive my kids to and from school at the very end of the school year. I was successful in that goal, but then the summer got really busy. I didn't get around to posting video, and I actually didn't take very good or very much video anyway. So obviously, since the last video, I got the body on the car. That was actually not too difficult of a process. My wife helped me, and the main thing that I can say is important is that the front goes on first, and then the body kind of translates back. The hardest part was trying to get the body over the trunk lid area. It is a tight fit there, but I was successful in getting it on. Uh, there were no cracks in the fiberglass that occurred during that. It was really overall fairly straightforward. I then put on the doors and the trunk lid. That was straightforward as well. Keep in mind that these components are not sized to fit. They are oversized, and so when you put them on, uh, for, the, for this phase of driving, uh, they are going to be too big. I'm going to go through and I'm going to do body work later on. But I knew I was going to take the body off again after putting some miles on the car because I wanted to first make sure everything seemed like it was working well. The next important part was making the car legal. As you can see, it is obviously not a complete car. Uh, they, there is no windshield. I have not yet put on the roll bars. And as I'll show you in a minute, I actually still have the transmission tunnel exposed. All of this was intentional because I wanted to be able to drive the car around and make sure that there wasn't anything glaringly wrong before I went and sealed up everything permanently. Here in Kansas, none of that creates a problem. You actually don't need to have a windshield on the car. Truthfully, I'm not even sure if I needed to have lights or anything functioning. However, the lights do all work. The process was remarkably simple. The hardest part was figuring out where to go because here in the Kansas City area there is only one location that you can go and there is only one officer who is able to perform the inspections by the highway patrol and fill out the forms so that you can then go and register the car. Once I found out that location it was pretty simple. The official statement is that you need to bring all of the receipts that, of everything that you bought going into the car. What they really mean in this case is that they're looking to make sure that none of the none of the components that you're using in your build are stolen. So for so the big things that they seem to be the most concerned with were the receipts from Factory 5 for the kit, receipts for the engine, transmission, rear end, and wheels and tires. Uh, I brought in a, a, a pile of other receipts as well, but it seemed like he wasn't all that concerned with it. I was really worried that this was going to be a problem, that he was going to ask about individual things that I may not have had a receipt for, but in reality, it seems like the main thing is get those big components together, try to bring as many receipts as you can, and then from there, it wasn't a problem. He was done in about 15 minutes. For me, the easiest way to handle getting the inspection done was to load the car up in my trailer and then drive to the highway patrol inspection station, towing it with my truck. This worked just fine, and then after I got the highway patrol paperwork taken care of, I went down to the county motor vehicle office where I was able to get it into turned into a legal car with a registration. This was actually where I had the hardest part, and the whole process down there took about three hours. There were a couple of reasons for this. The first one was that here in Kansas, when you have a kit-build car, they don't necessarily call it the make of the kit, they call it a make, the make as manufactured. So my insurance had listed a fa listed the car as a Factory 5 Mark IV Roadster. Um, I forget exactly what they ended up putting on the title, but I had to have call up Haggerty and have them change my insurance make and model, and then also the year because they listed the year as 2023 because that's when I'm registering it. So they had to change all of that. It was quick and straightforward, and they were able to email over proof of insurance very quickly. But that was the first delay. The other delay is that most motor vehicle offices aren't dealing with kit cars very often, and the woman who was helping me had never done it before, and even the senior person within the office had not done it in a number of years. So that was why it took so long. But in the end, I walked out with my temporary license plate, and a few days later, my license plate came in the mail from Topeka. I chose a personalized plate, SNEC, uh, which is what we have been calling this. The unfortunate part was that I wasn't able to get SNEC on the Gadsden flag license plate that Kansas offers. I thought that would be a really fun 
option. But uh, if you get that plate, which if you're not familiar with the Gadsden flag, that's the don't tread on me flag. Uh, they, if you get that license plate, they assign a number. You are not allowed to personalize it from there, which I thought was kind of ironic. But be that as it may, I have my license plate. I have my title. I have my insurance. I just went with Haggerty for insurance. They, the biggest reason for that is that aside from them being just really easy to deal with, they were the only ones that were willing to give me insurance without a restriction saying that the car could only be used for pleasure drives. This was really important to me because I want to be able to use the car for things like driving my kids to school. So far, that's my favorite thing to do with it. Most insurance companies actually have a restriction saying that you can only take it up for pleasure drives. Uh, to me, it just to me that didn't make very much sense. I would recommend dealing with Haggerty directly. Originally, I'd gone through my insurance broker, and then when I made some changes working with them directly, I got my premium to be less expensive for better coverage, uh, which speaks. I think more than anything to the lack of knowledge that my broker had about Haggerty's options. So like I said, I've got about 350 miles on the car at this point, and the overall it has been driving very well. A few things that, I've, that have come up. First one was that immediately I noticed that the uh, standard brake pads that I had put on the car were not going to be uh, very bitey for a manual brake application. I changed those out to EBC yellow stuffs, and I've been very happy with the performance of that since. Another thing that I'm going to address today is I'm going to helicoil the valve cover uh, holes on the cylinder heads. Uh, I have aluminum cylinder heads and as you may recall, I have to run spacers to be able to fit the uh, large roller rockers that I have uh, in the engine. The problem with this ends up being that I've got two gaskets that have to compress and aluminum heads, uh, aluminum is a weaker material than cast iron more prone to stripping out threads. And what's ended up happening is I have a couple of uh, valve cover bolt holes that have stripped out and that creates a, a leak from the valve covers. It's not a terrible leak, but it is enough that some oil is getting onto the exhaust manifolds and it's called causing smoking under a couple of conditions. Another thing that's happened so far is that the headlight switch that I had bought, which was a lower quality one, has broken already uh, and burned out. Uh, I think the fact it's a lower quality was probably the reason for it. Uh, I have ordered an AC Delco genuine one to uh, change it out with. A couple of other things I've done, I have installed a lower temperature thermostat. I'm now running a 160 instead of a 190, which for this engine and how it's working is probably a better temperature. I've installed a coolant overflow catch can, and then I also installed a breather catch can because I was getting some oil coming out of the breather. So overall, all, so overall, I've only had pretty minor issues so far. So today we're gonna to go through and I'm going to start off by trying to Healy coil the valve cover uh, bolt holes in the cylinder head. And then I'm gonna see how much else I have time to get working on. Here you can see where I put the breather can, catch can, and then also the coolant overflow can. One thing to note is, uh, and I'll put links to these uh, as well as to the headlight switches, both the, the one that failed on me and then also the genuine AC Delco one that I have ordered. But um, this coolant overflow can is nice because it's a good size and it fits conveniently. Um, on these Cobras, the coolant is a little bit of a challenge just because your thermostat housing and then your radiator cap are very close to the hood. The hood is very low and so you don't have a whole lot of extra height to work with uh, even with the engine sitting pretty low. So it's hard to get something that really fits well. Um, I liked how this fit however it was sealed and so if you look here I drilled a hole in the cap to make sure that uh, pressure did not build up in here. You don't want a coolant overflow can to get pressure built in it that kind of defeats the purpose of it. Here I've just got a, peat, uh, a, a breather along with a, um, a uh, PCV valve to go into the cylinder head. What was happening was uh, I was pretty clearly getting some form of crankcase pressure and oil was coming out of the breather and then it was going down onto the exhaust from there. Uh, this did help that situation significantly, but um, and these are both uh, inexpensive Amazon parts, but they work they've worked quite well. So you've got your breather catch can here, and then it's got a, just a drain out the bottom. Here you can see that I've got one bolt that has a bunch of washers on it, and I've got one over on the other side as well. So those are the ones that uh, 
that are stripped out. Um, I had to run a longer bolt with washers initially to even get any kind of a bite. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get, I've got my Healy coils, I'm going to try to drill everything out here. While I'm at it, I'll go ahead and I'll check the valve clearance, valve lash, make sure everything uh, seems like it's looking good, or at least I'll spot check it. We've got the passenger side valve cover off here, and if you look carefully, you might be able to see that a couple of the holes look different from the others. I'll start with this one right here, and if you notice, I can push this bolt in quite a ways before any threads engage. This one is one of the ones that was stripped out. Conversely, up here, there's threads all the way up to the top, maybe just a little bit. Maybe just the first thread got stripped. This one's all the way to the top. So is this one and this one. This one, which of course is the hardest to get at, this one feels like the first couple of threads are stripped. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do is I'll start off with these two, see how they go, and then uh, I'll see if I think that I can try to get to this one or if, I, if I'll only make it worse. It'd be perfectly doable if I didn't have the heater or conditioner box right there, but since I do, that's just something I have to deal with, and worst case scenario, I maybe just leave that uh, as is. I have a feeling that this hole down here is probably the one that's the source of my leak. Um, if you also notice, this, this surface is actually not quite as clean or smooth as I had thought that it was. So another thing is I may just need to put some sealant on to help this out a bit. Some of these older styles, uh, before they went to center bolt valve covers and things like that, just didn't inherently seal quite as well. And especially when I'm adding a spacer to it, um, it, it does make things a little bit harder. So I'll uh, drill these holes out and let's see how it goes. I ended up doing uh, these two center ones and then this one over here got them all Healy coiled. I'm not going to do the other three because those threads are in just fine shape. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get the valve cover on, make sure everything seems like it's tightened down properly, and if that's the case I'm going to move over to the other side. And then hopefully this will solve my issue here. Um, I did find when I took the valve covers off a couple of little pieces of debris that I think had maybe made their way in between. I also saw uh, a couple of strands of my header wrap had gotten in between the valve cover and the gas or the, the mating surface and the gasket. I'm hopeful that those are the reasons why I was having leaks and that that will solve it. So let's get this valve cover on, move to the other side. I'm finished up with Healy coiling over here. I only decided to do this one uh, hole. The others had uh, good threads all the way up to the top, so I figure I'm not going to put myself through the aggravation of doing more. Uh, I also managed to get this vacuum port down here. You can see where I've got my uh, Allen head. I've been trying to get this off before several times and I've been completely unsuccessful. Um, this time I just had some coil that I sprayed in, waited about 20 minutes, came right out. Um, this stuff's great. If uh, you haven't used it before, then uh, get some because you're going to find a time where it's helpful. So since I've got that vacuum port out, um, I'm going to go to the hardware store and get the uh, appropriate barb fitting so that I can then run from that catch can and use it as a, as a PCV rather than just as a breather. That should, in theory, help at least somewhat with, my, uh, with the valve cover oil leaking if I've otherwise got a good seal because I do have a feeling that there was a level of crankcase pressure being built up. Also, PCV is just good for your engine in general and helps to make a little bit more power. So I just want to point out something that I have not seen before or not had happened to me before when doing a Healy coil. Uh, I did this Healy coil and I went to go put the valve cover back on and the bolt really did not want to go in. Um, there must have been either some little bit of debris or I hadn't gotten the thing fully uh, tapped far enough uh, for the Healy coil, but I had to then run a quarter 20 tap through there after putting the Healy coil in and now it works just fine. Haven't come across that before so I just wanted to make a note of it. Um, don't get frustrated and try to force it then that can just that'll just make it worse. Just take your time. I decided to get the license plate on, uh, something I haven't done yet. If you look carefully you'll see that I had to modify the plate a bit which uh, is how some people handle this. 
uh, for the Mark IV Factory 5 made a trunk that was more uh, accurate to original Cobras, and it does not fit a standard United States plate on it. So there's, uh, there's a couple of mods that some people will do, but um, I decided to go with this route. It's a few weeks later, and I've gotten to finishing up a couple of these details. So I got the fitting needed for uh, making my breather a PCV, and I got the hose routed. You can see I just used a couple of zip ties to get the, uh, the vacuum hose to the engine out of the way. I've driven it probably uh, 50, 75 miles like this, and it definitely is uh, working well. Valve covers are back on, and the oil leaking that was coming out of them is completely resolved, so really happy with that. Another issue I've been working on resolving is my headlights. So I had put a GM headlight switch in here before, but it was an off-brand one, and it uh, seemed it failed after really not very much use. And one of the problems with it was that the way that it was set up, it would not run both the marker lights and the headlights on separate circuits. I had to wire them together, uh, and I'm not sure why that is, but GM's made these switches for a long time, and it seems like they tend they some of them have different wiring. So I'll put a link in the description to this particular switch, which this is a genuine GM part, uh, so should be higher quality. And let me show you what I did here. A little unclear, but so this this one right here is power, um, and this is power that specifically feeds the headlights, which are that pin right there. The way I have this set up, then there's a jumper that goes from this power input over to this pin, and then this pin provides power to the marker lights. That's this, this next pin right here, and then also to the dash lights, which are this pin back here. So if I turn the power on and I do the first click, you can see that the dash lights go on and they dim when I turn the dial as they're supposed to. Uh, if I walk around, you'd see that the marker lights are on and then headlights on with the next click and turn them back on. So I'm going to make sure that all of these connectors are seated and then I'm going to put the uh, headlight switch in and finish that up. All right, switch is in, turn it on, lights still dim, turn it on, headlights on. Before I conclude, one thing I will note is that part of the reason why I bought the off-brand headlight switch the first time around was because it came with the shiny uh, pull rod um, knob and uh, nut on here that holds the whole thing together. So there's still some value in it, I suppose, but uh, hopefully this genuine GM switch will last longer. So I think that's going to about do it for today's video. I uh, hope you found this interesting. Leave any questions down below, and as always, thanks for watching.